Ladies and gentlemen of the crypto space, we're live on a Wednesday, November 17th at 11.31 a.m. Not bad, not bad. It's Wednesday. We skipped Tuesday. We did Monday. I'm trying to keep a decent pace. I'm, uh, I also have my other responsibilities, so everything is uh, is decent. I took last Thursday and last Friday off, and uh, I'm, uh, I'm making mention of this because I like the way the last two weeks have been shaping up. Uh, we have obviously a very meaningful um, dampening of appreciative velocity in the crypto space over the last two weeks. So what better time to figure out what the heck we're doing, why we're doing it, and how we're doing it such that it's sustainable, such that we can actually keep it going and not drive ourselves mad. Can't sit there watching the prices all day unless it's yield on an interest-bearing position just coming in and you don't have to do any work so maybe you can sit there a little bit i wish there was a way to get like you know it'd be great like zapify widget i wonder how small it zooms down it's just too much i would want to piece together the particular or maybe it's claimable maybe it's literally just claimable that'd be really cool a claimable widget that goes on the desktop and it refreshes in real time <laughs> anyway, back to core principles, cash flow on the balance sheet, as the markets have been tamed, which is something we all are aware of. We want to remember our core principles and how uh, how we attack the crypto space in a sustainable way. Uh, cash flow and collateralizability, effectively a business balance sheet. And that is overwhelmingly sustainable because that's what history tells us that business does. It's how business works. So if we operate individually as a business, uh, we know how businesses have been success successful historically. So we'll take a look at a couple of things that I've been dabbling with. Um, uh, the core positions have remained unchanged. You guys should expect that at this point. Um, CVX CRV is off limits. It's it's just something that grows onto itself. It accumulates value. Uh, the uh, uh, the opportunity at hand hasn't changed at all. It's identical. It's solidified. It's entrenched at this point. So we don't really do. We have to talk about that. We can talk about whatever you guys want. As always, I I end up always going to the comments to find what to talk about. So I'm. That's what I'll end up doing in two seconds anyway. So, Curve's hot, as it always was. Convex is still hot, as it always has been. Frax is hot, in my opinion. Spell is hot, as everyone's aware. Um, the chart is a little scary, but that's irrelevant in most regards. Oh, I leaked my zapper. Doxed. <laughs> Where's Spell? Let's take a look at the Spell chart. Um, so spell on the daily mean regression to the what is that the fifty? Is that the fifty SMA? That's the fifty SMA on the daily. Note that it's below it. It might actually stick because look at this price action region or con price region of price action congestion. This is not the most unreasonable place for it to stick. Um, be nice to see the daily close above the 50 SMA. Let's go on to the weekly. So that's another good reason why it could stick. The 10 SMA. Oh, my God. Extraordinary to see price action sticking to the 10 SMA on the weekly. So it's a relatively new chart, but that's a solid 10 SMA. And that's a solid hit and wick right off the bad boy. So you guys know. My uh, my opinion of spell uh, is that predominantly it's hard to take an entry. It's a good entry probably now, better than ever, but there's also no reason it can't uh, do a mean regression down to its lower price action region of congestion, which is down here. Well, it should be about another 60 70% rip to the downside. Are we going to do something like that? I don't know. I would hope not. I don't rule it out. But um, I think the market has more to it, and I think I'm hopeful that the market is not as trivial and shallow 
as uh, historically markets have shown they can be. What does that mean? That means, um, you know, historically markets are just extracting as much capital as possible. Dollar gains, no no allegiance, no vested interest. I, I would hope that's not the case. And I hope these assets, people appreciate them for what they are, how meaningful they are. We'll see. We we'll only know in hindsight whether the general public is still stupid or not. I think that is a interesting statement, and we'll see the, these the value of these assets go up uh, more and more um, as the general public becomes less and less stupid. Maybe the assets won't go up, and the general public would prove exactly what they have been for all these years: stupid, not buying things that are meaningful. Buying things like stocks that have no cash flow, have negative real rates of returns with regard to dividends, and are generally useless other than a speculative buy low, sell high, and hopefully someone's going to buy some shit for you for more. And that's where all stocks are. Anyway, let's let's do some commentary. I have a lot of catch up, catching up to do. It's a, an eight-minute monologue at this point. And I don't want you guys to get too far ahead. Uh, Card Toy, hello, early, a pleasure. Bradley, yo, 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 Malik, in Coomer, yes. This is in Coomer territory right here. Pretty much everyone on the stream is an in Coomer at this point. <laughs> Crypto bets, morning cap, what's for lunch? I don't know. I'm hungry. Uh, I, I, I just had a quest bar, but anyway. I got to get something. It's been a very busy morning. I got up at 5 o'clock this morning, an hour before I had to get my daughter to school at 7 o'clock. Point being, we usually get up at 6 and leave at 7, but the alarm clock wasn't adjusted for daylight saving, so that has thrown me off all day today. Oh, my God. Anyway, Eduardo, hello. Matthew, thanks for having us. A pleasure. Ding, ding, in the house. I aped into Avax Blizz. You got a little Blizz action? Um, I've been watching Blizz. Now, obviously, the rate of return is much higher than Geist. Um, but I've been, I've been dabbling with Geist. Um, I don't know whether one is better or worse. I don't know whether better or worse is the assessment to be made. What I know is I expect the light locked percent APR to come down as the platform stabilizes and hopefully finds a bottom. We saw a Geist down at 47 cents, which is nice to see. Popped up to 51, back down to 50. Um, I'd like to find bottom before I deploy more capital. Um, I bought some at a buck 06. I bought the, the second position. Uh, yesterday, probably, I think it was 47, 48 cents. So the position is up a little bit in that regard. But uh, these are nice numbers. I'm not going to complain. These numbers would be massive on Blizz. Something be like twenty five, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 a week if if this was on Blizz. It's up at $2,500, $3,000% APR. And you know what that number is compounded. It's a 581% compounded daily. Something like 70,000, 80,000% APY. It's just an absolutely ridiculous number. About a thousand bucks a day, $914 a day. Nothing to sneeze out there. Anyway, I'm sure other folks are going to have other questions about Blizz and, and Geist. Uh, let's keep it going. Uh, Flixium? My man, <laughs> how you doing? I'm okay. I'm, uh, I'm exhausted, but I'm okay. Steven, long time fan, love the content and old school uh, radio presenter style. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. I, I hope my presentation is enjoyed by as many as I can help. It's all about helping folks. Uh, all this is me trying to figure shit out, and if I'm figuring this shit out with you guys, you know, we'll all figure this shit out together. Something like that, Steven. It's a pleasure. Uh, Jonathan, morning. What are your thoughts on minimum investment for Ethereum chain? Curve, abracadabra, gas fees are so high that it doesn't make sense for capital under X amount. Well, if you're going to buy $50 worth of Ethereum and it's a $50 transaction, clearly it's a non-starter. Um, operating on Ethereum mainnet is indeed a burden from a gas transaction fee perspective, um, but that's where the money is, the big money. 
You know, that's where the million dollar transactions or the, you know, the eight figure transactions are going on. The echoes on on the other chains, but, you know, that's the big money's on Ethereum mainnet. And that's meaningful. And that's where Curve is. And that's where Convex is. And that's where you stake your S Bell, albeit S Bell is now available on, uh, on Spirit and uh, on Phantom, S Bell Spell Pool. So you can get S Bell, which is stake spell, which accrues value uh, from uh, the debt payments to the system um, on Phantom. So you, you can stake spell on Phantom. That's what S Bell is, um, period. So that is meaningful. Uh, the money's on Ethereum. I would say um, it's it's hard to give very clear cut advice of like when to do something on Ethereum mainnet versus another chain. You know, optimally, it's optimally you're operating on one chain for simplicity's sake, so you don't have to coordinate where the hell capital is and write instructions for your spouse on where to find capital should it ever be needed. Um, so we create we have this mess where we have multiple chains. I don't see any downside to, to operating on Phantom or Avalanche or Arbitrum or even Polygon for that matter. Uh, the hardest, the, impl the biggest implication obviously is gas fees is cheaper, but probably the hardest thing to account for is documentation and keeping track of all the positions. Zapper helps, but that doesn't give instructions on how to consume the protocol if that's something that's important because I, I know that's something that I have to always consider. Anyway, um, Flim Hi, my man from Ireland in the house. It's a pleasure. W T H. Hey Noah, what what's your setup look like? Mac desktop. Uh, I have a Mac Mini with a with um an eGPU and three monitors, three 4K monitors. That's basically the way I've operated for the last couple of years. Except there wasn't a Mac Mini the last couple of years. It was just like a MacBook Pro. Uh, but the Mac Minis nowadays are very powerful. Uh, the only and, and when I I, I was going to go for like a, one of the twenty-two inches, one of the the nice um, uh, the, their five K monitors and all that fancy shit. But I was I realized that the Mac Mini, the only shortcoming of the high end sixty-four gig version, um, was the GPU. But we could get eGPUs nowadays, and then it's a relatively powerful unit for a very cost-effective price. And that turned out to be a great decision because I needed 64 gigs of RAM. I can't operate a desktop nowadays without 64 gigs of RAM. I'm just saying we've entered a 64 gig world, <laughs> in my opinion. <laughs> uh, Killers cash flow, cash flow, cash flow. What does it mean without cash flow? It's, isn't that everything that matters? If you could pull down a thousand dollars a day, you have choices and options now. Clearly. You know, I've watched about 20, 25% of my portfolio evaporate over the last couple of days, um, being very heavy in, in curve and, and spell, but that's okay. And I know the cash flow that they're generating is, is mutually exclusive from this cash flow. Once you have enough cash flow, you, you could watch large, um, a, a large uh, uh, movement in your principal valuations but that's the red herring and that's what i've i've been talking about the last couple months last two years really that the principles of red herring and what's pertinent is the cash flow i mean if you have as i've said if you have 10 million dollars pulling in five thousand dollars a week and then all of a sudden you have a half a million five million dollars pulling in five thousand dollars a week you have $5,000 coming in a week. You have a business that's pulling in $5,000 a week. That's what matters. And you can let all these other people out there worry about the price of assets and drive themselves nuts about whether the market's going up or the market's going down. I'm not going to drive myself nuts over that shit. What I'm going to focus on is how much cash am I making on a weekly basis. And that's what matters most, in my opinion. Um, Barry's in the house, a pleasure, kill a Zapify widget would be delicious, right? How cool would that be? I'd sure as hell like one. Uh, can you talk about how to borrow on cash flow? Well, you're not borrowing on cash flow. That's some legacy finance shit right there. But, um, you borrow on 
we go over to abracadabra, you can borrow on cash flow assets, cash assets that produce cash flow. Abracadabra obviously is relatively new, but that's why they're so popular, and that's why they're probably underestimated in, in almost all regards. Because if you go over to borrow, you notice these are convex positions. CVX Tri Crypto. Uh, Tri Crypto, Ren, and Three Pool. Damn. Still 10 million left. There's plenty of room left in these positions. These are all cash flow producing positions. So Tri Crypto, let's take a look at Tri Crypto on Ethereum. Try crypto. Oop. Try crypto on Ethereum. Try crypto is cranking out 16.61%. So you get an asset that's producing like a thousand times more money than any of the shit on the stock market. 16% returns. Um, and you're able to borrow against it. So that's how you do it. Can you talk about how to borrow on cash flow? Well, I'm going to borrow on an asset that's yielding 16 and change percent, and I'm going to borrow cash. So you're borrowing on cash flow. And your debt, technically, it's a self-paying loan because the interest is only 3.5%, yet the position is paying 16.61%. So that's this, that's what Alchemix does. Um, if, if you guys notice that, it's, it's right there. It's just very simple right in front of us. If we're only paying 3.5% interest, but this is yielding 16 and change percent, that's the deal. CVX Ren. Let's see what Ren's doing. 5.26. Even at 5.26. Oh, this is still very much cash flow positive. 0.5% on the debt and 5% on uh, on the, the collateral, on the LP position. That's pretty cool. And there's still 10 million available. So Bitcoin is a very profitable asset. The problem is it has a huge amount of opportunity costs. It's only generating five and change percent. You go over to Badger and crank up those returns because these uh, 5% over here on Convex then be rookie numbers. <laughs> and um, albeit you can leverage them. You're not going to, you can't leverage your Badger interest bearing Bitcoin positions yet. Maybe inevitably probably inevitably why not why can't you just leverage everything borrow cash against everything just as long as you manage well, the plat that's what's brilliant about the platform it just manages it as a collateralized debt position if uh if the debt the health ratio the health factor so to speak breaches the threshold it gets liquidated and here's your liquidation fee it's a very clear cut rules of the road how it operates if you are liquidated, you uh, pay a liquidation fee, and then you get your your capital back. Obviously, and denominated in in what it was purchased using. Odds are, it's probably a stable coin. Anyway, let's keep it going. Here, here for it. Frax, spell, convex, curve, all F positions. Uh, yeah, for myself. FXS is VEFXS. Spell is S Spell on the Abracadabra website. Convex is CVXCRV. Curve, I have an old VECRV position, but that's not the point. Point is, all my positions are Ethereum. You got to remember, I'm a little biased, guys, because a lot of my positions are when Ethereum was like $15 transaction fees. Um, 2020, summer, like June, July, August. It was like $30 transaction fees. So it's hard now at 125 252 as a max fee. 125 guay. Men. You know, you're talking $100 transaction fees. Transaction fees are easily three, four, five times the size of, of where they were last year. So a little bias in that regard because my positions all were started when gas was ten, fifteen, twenty dollar transaction fees. And even cheaper. Late twenty nineteen they were even cheaper. Um what's the play with spell? There is no play with anything. These are passive positions. Everything I talk about is literally just holding positions. As Child says, in coomers. We are in coomers. I'm the in coomer and that's what I talk about. Uh, spell is S-Spell. The play is S-Spell. Uh, you can borrow against S-Spell. S-Spell is a 
there's an interest bearing position. If you go over to stake, this is what their the print is, 22 and change percent, give or take. I have a couple of S bells sitting around. Um and if there's anything available, you can borrow against it. So there's 1.77 million MIM you can borrow right now. Uh, that won't last long. Hmm. I should borrow some MIM while it's still available. Um, so it's an interest-bearing asset, a cash flow-producing asset that you could collateralize and borrow capital against. That's the game. Borrow capital against cash flow producing assets. Use the cash flow to pay down the debt. So you, what you're doing is you're converting a large short-term capital gain into a drawn-out series of uh, this, uh, of uh, of income. So you're getting income over a period of time. You have to allocate, uh, I would argue, income tax. Um, and use that income to pay down debt obligations. And that's basically the way the wealthy do it, and that's the way I intend to do it. Whether I am paying income tax or a short-term capital gains tax treatment, this is all very dependent on tax jurisdiction, whether it's a tax-friendly state. For me in Florida, it's a relatively tax-friendly state from an income perspective. There's no state income tax. So that's why I always talk about income because I also value simplicity, even though capital, short-term capital gains may be preferential in some regards. Uh, the simplicity of a, a single top-line income number for the year, that's very meaningful. So I really like the notion of treating all of this as income. An incomer, Chilled says... <laughs> What's up with Ampleforth? I haven't been looking at it much. I've been letting it sit. Um, it's below a dollar, so we have negative rebase territory. V2 market. Let's go over here. Where are you, Ampleforth? So it's not being borrowed, and I I was disappointed. So that was a an invalidation of my hypothesis that in periods of negative rebase, we'd have high utilization. So my hypothesis was invalidated. So we adjust accordingly, and that's okay. Deposit APY is 0.5%. You know, it was like a buck seventy, buck eighty. I told everyone it's guaranteed to go down. It's literally guaranteed. It's one of the few assets in the crypto space that's actually guaranteed to go down. Now, bear in mind, you know, allocating one percent of the portfolio, which I have, um, it's not. It's just an interesting position. Nothing has changed. Um, just the invalidation of the lending hypothesis that utilization rates would remain high. Now, the other primary characteristic is that it's still ample forth and you'll have transitory periods of opportune liquidation. So it'll go back up to over a dollar, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 cents. Inevitably, we have the spikes. You can look at the price chart all you want and just holding the position. The, the biggest complexity is the red herring of the price point. Um, you really want to look at the market cap. So there's two factors uh, m to understanding how your position is doing over time. And it's not just price point with Ampleforth. It's the actual quantity of assets you have, which will change over time. Y you're probably seeing the quantity of assets you have decrease, which is the negative rebase component. And what hopefully is the case is that there's periods of greater positive rebase, meaning if you're 55, 65% of the time in positive rebase territory, that means the market cap's going to be growing. Not necessarily the price, but the market cap. So you, to understand where your position is, how well your position is doing with Ampleforth, you really want to watch the market cap rather than the price point. Very complicated, but you know that's what we played with for a couple of days. It was exciting to see this is the 80 something, 87,000 percent APY, but you guys know what this is, right? 578 percent compound the daily is something like 70,000 percent APY. So it's the same thing here. APR converted to APY. Um, 575. Compounded daily. No, that's AP. Oh, nope, that's backwards. Backwards.
575 compounded daily. It's 29. It's 30,000% APY. 650. And you see how the APR goes up, the compounding goes up significantly. So where are we right now? We're specifically at 578. Okay, I'll take 30,000% APY compounded daily. Weekly? Daily? Big difference if you compound daily versus weekly. I expect it to pre depreciate, though. I expect guys to depreciate further 50 cents. I hope I have cash sitting around. And I hope to buy it like 30 cents. That'd be pretty cool. That'd be pretty cool. Uh, DeFi Goat, any thoughts on the potential of RGT and Fay merger? No opinion at this time. Eric's in the house. A pleasure. Second live stream. Got to make it a regular thing. <laughs> More lobby. How are you? Thoughts on interest-bearing tokens that are inflationary? Inflationary assets are going to depreciate over time. It's guaranteed. <clears throat> Even though Joe is paying out rewards through inflation, the fact that you can earn protocol fees still makes it a good asset, in my opinion. Um... I don't here analytics perfect there's a burn component to Joe which I don't fully understand and it's not really talked about I think Joe is a solid play uh, from a yield perspective just do your standard opportunity cost analysis look extra over time which means Joe is being staked and that means Joe is being removed from circulating supply which has a tendency to be price appreciative. And this always caught my eye. What does this burn component mean? Oh, you know what it is? When you stake and unstake Joe, you're minting or burning X Joe. So that's what that means. I'm surprised I never saw that. Or never understood what I literally what I just said. I was thinking from a Joe burn component, but now I realize that it says X Joe minted and burn. And when is X Joe minted and burn when it's staked and unstaked? Well, this is a good trend to see though. An X Joe total supply. We want to see this go up, up, and up. That means there's less and less circulating supply. So interest bearing tokens that are inflationary will produce that's like curve. Uh you have to have more and more CVX CRV over time uh, to compensate for the dilution of other people that are locking their position. Um, it makes it complicated. It means you have to keep up on the asset, you have to compound, and you have to grow your position. Um, it's certainly not easy. Uh, and inflationary assets make it that much harder. So that's why FXS is, uh, is tantalizing. Can you please talk about what CVXFXS would entail. Um, nothing that comes to mind worth really talking about other than it being the same as convex. Uh, they will accumulate a VEFXS, and, and that it's the same flywheel effect. Um, they'll take FXS, lock it for you as VEFXS. So they'll do the same thing that CVXCRV does. Um, yeah, Quest Bar is a pretty good, Dan. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I look forward to CVX FXS if that is the case, if that is coming. And speculatively, we could, you know, say it's probably likely. Um, I'm also quite interested in the the FPI uh, drop and what's entailed with what Sam has in mind for that. Uh, that's very powerful stuff. You know, they were talking about some very serious tech Um and it's not just very serious tech to just isolate it to the crypto space. It's just serious tech from a macro financial perspective. Like in the context of shit that sovereign countries have created over the last however many years, hundreds of years, these persons, these software engineers in the crypto space are making some serious shit. So I'm quite impressed, to say the least. Dan, also read Blizz. I do like the ability to take out specific tokens versus all. Yeah, that's interesting. I did notice that. Nuno, hey, sir, good day to you. How do you see time going from hyperinflationary to an investment down with a deflationary policy? Is it risk in that transition? I'm not knowledgeable on that transition. Is that actually occurring? 
Um, I don't fully understand um, the, the hyperinflationary returns and auto compounding and the rebase component and how they all play into each other uh, with regard to the value of a portfolio position, uh, meaning you're clearly getting 600 and change percent APR, which is 80 something thousand percent APY when it's auto compounded. Um, how does rebasing factor into that? How do, uh, and rebasing makes me think that the overall market cap of, uh, of Wonderland time may be more meaningful than the price point of time. Um, the fact that it's building a treasury is extraordinary and that is completely unprecedented how, how that plays out over time. We have no idea what's going to happen. There's no history. There's no precedence for a protocol having all these valuable assets on the balance sheet. So I, I would say we're mostly in uncharted territory with regard to um, Olympus Dow and Wonderland. That's the best I could say. Okay, what is this? Hey, Noah, love your market commentary. Do you think it's rational to accumulate CRV and CVX at these levels for someone who doesn't hold any? Well, you know, there's a couple of folks on Twitter that talk a certain way, and I, I tend to talk uh, the same. JT talks about it's Bitcoin's never get into the 70, 80, 90 grand. And then if it does, it's an under-promise, over-deliver type scenario. So I will say this. I expect the market to take a fat hit. And if it doesn't take a fat hit, oh, yeah, baby. But didn't we just take a fat hit? How how can we say that this market has not taken a fat hit when you have charts like this, a mean regression, well, to the 10 SMA on the weekly. Ooh. But then again, if you look over on on stuff like uh, the S&P, you have no mean regressions either. Oh, I have absolutely no indicators up whatsoever. Uh, better. I like better. So you have no mean regressions either on the week. Let's go to the weekly. So what the fuck? <laughs> oh, it, it just, everything seems to go straight up. So the fact that we see some mean regressions on crypto assets uh, means the crypto market is healthier than maybe even the legacy financial space. I don't know what it means. Well, no, in hindsight, but I think that's an interesting statement. Can crypto be healthier than legacy finance? Because there's clearly no mean regressions going on on this chart. <laughs> this chart is straight up. Who would buy this shit? I don't know. I have no idea who would buy this. This is the S&P 500. I sure as hell would have buy it. Uh, why? Uh, so wait, so the, okay, what is this? I was asking about purchasing. So I don't have the best entries. But um, what I've been telling friends and family is to dollar cost average. Take 50 bucks, 100 bucks, and you accumulate positions. And then you'll figure out um, position sizing and the other rules of portfolio management because it's hard. It's easy to buy shit. It's hard to understand why you're buying it and the significance of it in a, in a portfolio. What does it mean? How do you manage it? When do you sell it? When do you lock it? When do you stake it? And that's exactly what you're asking, Dim Angel Productions. Why buy and stake Geist over something like Omen Time? That's an opportunity cost analysis. That's a great question because Geist is capitalizing on transaction fees, platform transaction fees from a money market. And Omer Time um, is a backed asset. It's a reserve asset or an asset that's backed by a reserve, one or the other. It's unprecedented what the heck it is. So we're still trying to digest what it is because they're very different assets. That's why. And and this goes into how you structure a portfolio. And you have to know what you're allocating value to. They're very different assets. Um Anyway, those are actually two really good questions. Okay, what is this? When and if to get into CRV or CVX? And Dim Angel, why 
buy something like Geist over Omer Time. Very different assets. We have to understand the state of the market, the stage of the market. We're very late cycle. We can have significant mean regressions. You do your opportunity cost analysis, and you also have to consider the portfolio balance and what type of assets you're sizing accordingly. Um, I like my yield from platform transaction fees. And frankly, Spell is, is not platform transaction fees necessarily. Uh, those are debt interest payments. So broadly, they're platform transaction fees. But a platform transaction fee really is like a, a, a curve, an, an AMM, where people are doing transactions from one asset to another, and you're getting a cut of the transaction. So Abracadabra really came in from left field with a heck of a protocol. That's a heck of a platform transaction fee. That's not where we were getting them from typically. Debt interest payments. That's what caught my eye about Spell the most. Um, let's keep it going. Uh, Damien, how, how are you? It's a pleasure. Damien from Pantera. It's a pleasure. How about that? <laughs> I, I thank you. I hope my content is meaningful and helps as many people as possible make better decisions. I know I say that every time. So it keeps me grounded. Something like that. Um, more lobby. Espel is on Avalanche. Okay, that's great. Whether it's on Avalanche, whether it's on Phantom, Arbitrum, it's all good. Uh, what's pertinent is that you're using a platform that you're comfortable with. The hardest thing about the crypto space is finding your comfort zone. And that results in um, uh, lack of commitment, uh, so lack of conviction. So if you're nervous or worried about a position, you're going to sell it, you're going to buy it, you're going to sell it, you're going to buy it, and you're going to get eaten up by transaction fees. Um, and this is why people fear the Ethereum mainnet, because it's very expensive. And you probably can't even get away with one transaction fee. But maybe if you save up to your target position size for CVX CRV, and you do one transaction, one deposit, that's logical and reasonable. Um, maybe it's not a good thing. Maybe it's not a good thing for transaction fees to be cheap. That's something I've been thinking about. How about that one? And Moral Lobby, you're making me think about this. Um, if transaction fees are cheap, you are you are given the privilege of lacking conviction. And where are you going to park capital? You know, if you're on Polygon and it's 20 cents for a transaction, you could deposit an LP here, remove an LP there. You don't need to flip flop on transact or flip flop on positions as such. You need to have your conviction. So maybe the more expensive transaction fees um, are good for investors. Food for thought. How about that one? <laughs> uh, Diogo. Hey, Noah, do you think that Curves Try Crypto on Phantom is a good choice for ones outside Ethereum? Why not? Um, aside from the specifics to the rewards, you mentioned 30% APR probably. Um, Phantom has great liquidity, has good depth, and so does Avalanche, and so does Arbitrum, <laughs> and so does Polygon. So it's all good, so why would I say it's bad? I would say it's good. Uh, so you're asking if I think it's a good choice. Good is a subjective conclusion, no doubt. And what you're going through is a period or a process of opportunity cost analysis. If you if you're questioning whether it's good, you think maybe something else is better. And you'll end up going from one asset to another, one position to another. Hey, what if I told you that Tri Crypto on Avalanche was better? Oh, I got to sell, liquidate my, or take my capital out of that LP position on Phantom and move it over to Avalanche. And I, I don't, that's no way to operate in the crypto space. That's no way to be sustainable. You're going to frustrate yourself. You're going to spend too much time in front of the computer. Phantom and Avalanche are going to facilitate that kind of behavior because of cheap transaction fees. Maybe the best bet is an Ethereum position. Yeah, try crypto on Ethereum, cranking out serious returns on Convex. 
which means um, you're going to have to save up to pay that gas fee. And you're going to be very hesitant to withdraw the position because of the gas fee. So the gas fee will help you find conviction. And I always think about conviction when someone asks me whether something is good or bad. That's why I like the stream. I like to talk to you guys because it's not my role at all to tell you guys what is a good position or a bad position. Shit, I don't know what the heck a good position or a bad position is. It's just subjective. Everyone will have a different interpretation of what is good or bad. Some people are playing around with Blizz on Avalanche. And I opted for Geist on Phantom. Even though there's less APY, but maybe because there was a little bit more transparency in the documentation. Maybe because I opt for Phantom over Avalanche. And maybe I opt for Phantom over Avalanche for irrational reasons. Avalanche has some serious traction. It's fast. Relatively cheap. I like the finality. Incredible in that regard. Uh, but Phantom has the, the pension of uh, of prominent crypto actors like Andre. Andre likes Phantom. The whole Yarn team, Bantag, likes Phantom. They all like Phantom. So that has always caught my interest. Anyway, I digress. I digress. Stephen, hey Noah, tips for finding projects early as possible. You don't want early. And I knew, I know folks think early is best. My philosophy is never early and never late. You don't want to be too early. If you were too early on Geist, you got screwed. Too early on Blizz, you screwed. Because they're hyperinflationary with regard to what's going on with circulating supply. And um, that causes powerful depreciative force. Massive depreciation has occurred. So too early and you got hammered. But you saw what? Was it like 2,000% APR on the lock guys? Yeah. Of course it was 2,000%. The amount of uh, early exit penalties that were occurring. Big early exit penalties. 51 cents. How do you like that? Is that maybe it's the first time it went from forty seven cents to fifty one from a lower price point to a higher price point? I'm quite surprised to see that um so I don't have any tips on on finding projects early because if I find the project early, I'm gonna wait and I'm not gonna do anything. I'm gonna try and understand what's going on so i'm I'm actually liking uh time maybe a little bit more than ohm. And that has to do with community, the market actors, the sentiment, so on and so forth. But that doesn't mean one is better than the other. And we're certainly not early. We're later than early. We, we, we now see what, what the asset is becoming in many regards. What I'm uh, wanting to try and wrap my head around a little bit more is how, how the asset performs during a deflationary impulse. And that's what I keep reminding myself of. And that's why I'm hesitant to take a position. Because I know during a deflationary impulse, shit's going to hit the fan. Uh, and what will happen is you'll get to the risk-free premium. You'll get to the risk-free premium, or the price per ohm, as ohm calls it. And it's the same thing for time. If you go over to the dashboard, so you'll you'll get to maybe fifteen hundred, two grand. Maybe the backing per time gets up to two thousand twenty five hundred, and then the time price gets down to three grand during a strong deflationary impulse. What I know is the market is still hot, and uh, that's probably my biggest sentiment right about now for Wonderland and uh, and Ohm. I wasn't early. And because I wasn't willing to take that added risk to be early, I'm still not late because the general public doesn't know shit about anything that's going on. But now I want to find an opportune entry. So I'm calculating in my mind when's the best entry. The best entry would be backing per ohm. So during a deflationary impulse, we would have a strong reduction in the backing per ohm as the principal components on their balance sheet decrease in value. So let's say that goes down to 100 bucks. And ohm price is down at 150. Bam! Now you're talking 200 bucks per ohm. So that's a hit. 
That's Warren Buffett's tactic. By the blood. By the blood. He's got $140 billion sitting around ready to buy the blood after whatever, whenever the next deflationary impulse comes. So omen time come to mind uh, where I want to buy the blood. But how do you buy the blood? You buy the blood with cash flow. <laughs> so I got cash flow accumulating. I'll let this sit for a bit. I got cash flow accumulating on my convex as well. I'm just going to let that sit, especially now. Now that the market is is cooling down, this is where you let it sit, such that you have cash flow if you need to deploy it if the market starts to turn around again, when the market starts to turn around again. Um, let's keep it going. Let's wrap it up in a couple minutes, but let me hit as many questions as I can. Ryan's in the house. Still have mixed thoughts on Ample. What is the daily percent you'll be making with negative rebase? Probably 0%. Uh, as of right now, you're making nothing on lending on Aave. So it's a pretty uh, objectively poor position. Food for thought. How to, what to do with that? I don't know. I let it sit at, at 1% of the portfolio. I just let it sit. Um, Genie Kid, have you taken a look at DeFi Chain? Have not. Uh, Dan, re S spell cash flow. There's no way to manually extract yield, though. No, it's auto compounded. Uh, Dan, in terms of the way you can take out your yield on convex, no. On convex, obviously, the yield is mutually exclusive and it's treated as income. Uh, whereas on S spell, it is auto compounded, so it does have improved tax uh, efficiency. Avril, hey there, Noah. Big fan of your stream. Changing the way of thinking about wealth building. Was wondering about Geist and and Blizz, how safe do you reckon they are to deposit and earn, given no audits? Given no audits, they are highly unsafe. It is extremely dangerous. Go under, proceed under the notion you'll probably lose all your money. So, which means, hesitate. That's when you do hesitate. I think Geist and Blizz are a great place to hesitate. I expect significant depreciation. There is no reason not to expect this to approach this and um and the fact that there's no audit audits is also something to keep in mind when position sizing um so this is probably about a half a percent quarter percent of the portfolio i know that's a relatively large number but it is what it is and i expect guys to go down 30 cents uh, this means people are still liquidating the crap out of geist that accounts for the difference. You're getting four, four hundred percent over four hundred percent, four hundred and twenty percent APR because people are paying a fifty percent penalty to vest their geist. That's massive. So Blizz is even more than that. There will be a bottom. There will be a point in time where the, there is more value to be had locking guys than there is to sell it and that's the inflection point of when this is uh, op that's the optimal entry point for the largest amount of capital you want to deploy to it um, as of right now you, you you're, you're dabbling a little bit so here that's probably the best answer avril there's no audits position size risk considerate small quarter percent half a percent whatever Give it time. Watch the lock Geist. The APR approach to stake Geist. You want to see less Geist being liquidated over time, which means it's becoming increasingly value to lock the Geist versus sell it. Once you see the the uh, the, uh, the inflection point occur and Geist starts to appreciate maybe, or lock Geist has settled around 200, 225% as compared to stake Geist being 140, you know, maybe like 20, 30, 40, 50% higher. Lock guys being 20, 30, 40, 50% higher than stake guys to APR. That is reason to think you probably hit price bottom. That is the optimal entry for guys that's at price bottom. So that considering the audits, you probably still don't want to go too high on the position size, maybe 1%, 2% of the portfolio. This is not something that I'm thinking in my mind to do a 10, 15, 20% allocation to which is something I did for a couple of assets over the years. Very few, 
Very few assets I've done very large allocations. You want the 1% to turn into 10% and that changes the portfolio. If you're throwing around 20% of your portfolio at a clip, you're taking on extreme risk, especially if you're doing an allocation of that size this late in the market. No reason if you throw around 20%, you can't have 50% of that position get obliterated by a deflationary impulse this late in the market. So be careful with position sizing and entries at this point. Um, Vince, no, is there any difference between the two CVX CRV farms on Convex? Yeah, I use the new one. I don't know which one the new one is off the top of my head because I'm not dabbling with the, the CVX CRV farms. Yes, there is a difference. One is old, one is new. Um, Frog Nation, Jeremy, Frog Nation. I'm a Frog Nation. I participate in the Frog Nation. I might be old, I might be 38, but I'm Frog Nation material. <laughs> Sheesh, uh, Noah, you're amazing. Thank you. Thank you. I hope we all can do better. And that's the whole point of all these streams I've done over the years. Dim Angel Productions, but if the goal is high compound APY, why not Omer Time? Because Omer Time are not transaction fee revenue streams. Albeit, that's what like Sifu, and he's not really public, but that that's who does a good part of uh, of, uh, of development. Avra side and Frog Nation side. They're talking about transaction fees. So if the treasury of Wonderland becomes a revenue producer and that revenue is distributed to persons with memo, ooh, okay, fine. That changes everything. Um, then you still have... Uh, Diversification requirements mean just because the best opportunity uh, may be one asset, it doesn't mean you completely ignore other opportunities. I mean, look, look if one to at a time, keep doing what they're doing and fulfill their almighty destiny, you're not going to want to own a piece of curve. The the global Forex market, <laughs> you're not going to want to own um, a piece of, uh, of Frax. A very meaningful, very powerful, considering how much CVX they own, a, a stable coin, partially collateralized and what they're working on with regard to the, the FPI. Not going to want to own that. So that, this is a great question and why I always say I'm not going to make the most money possible because I don't want to just have the best asset. I want to have smart, smartly chosen assets. A concentrated yet diverse portfolio of carefully crafted positions. Well thought out with good logic and reason. That's the deal. It's not about making the most money as possible. It's about making the smartest decisions possible. Genie Kid, is time legit? Well, you're late. <laughs> it's 8000 and change. I remember one time was I saw it briefly at 100 bucks. I'm just saying. But yes, it is legit from a from a functional standpoint and what they're trying to build. Very legit, very interesting. Barry, it's not if is it not better to put ample on Geyser V two instead of keeping it on Ave and get some yield? So there you go. There's twenty thirty percent yield uh, on the ample fourth uh, Geyser. Um, that's a good deal. More lobby. Okay, thanks so much for the insight. It's a pleasure. Tap C. Hey, Noah, you are inspiring me to ascend from chaser to incumer. Nice to catch you live, my friend. It's a pleasure. Stop chasing around. Go out to dinner. Make some gains. Get some cash flow. Look at this cash flow. I hope it stays. That's nice. We're talking about three hundred grand a year on fifty-seven thousand dollars. That's remarkable. What else to look at before I wrap up the stream? Take a look at Spell. Let's swap it over to the daily and let's see how it's doing today. It's still below that 50 SMA. Look at the curve chart, by the way. Curve looks good. Look at this nice hammer followed by an inverted hammer above the 50 SMA on the daily. Woo! I love this chart. This is, you know, we were talking about this for weeks and months, how gorgeous this chart is. Look at that. Look at that wick, that capitulation wick. It didn't even get the previous support flip resistance. Is, is this going to prove to be resistance? Or was the resistance back here? 
because there's some there was a wick below and it totally broke out. I think this is a great depiction of breakout support flip resistance. And once this gets to a higher high above 570, which is this previous price point back when Curve first launched, uh, this is going to be a beautiful asset from a price point perspective. Yeah. Hyperinflation, DeFi summer, DeFi, DeFi, DeFi 2021, which wasn't really DeFi summer because it was post-January. And then the big breakout. When we had hyperinflation converted to disinflation, converted to pretty much a deflationary asset. How the hell do you have a hyperinflationary asset be net deflationary? That's the most extraordinary monetary policy. This is going to be studied from a monetary policy standpoint. So folks are going around chasing returns. Meanwhile, maybe the best assets always staring us right in the face and assets that's uh that's down um price range it's down 41 percent i mean look did anyone come on the stream today and say curve how well, a couple of people did but did the vast majority of folks come on the stream say saying curve oh this is the hottest asset it's up a million percent no people haven't talked about this on the stream this isn't the hot asset. The hot asset is Blizz cranking out 3,000% APY and Geist with 500 and change percent as of today. No one's talking about Curve down 40% as being, whoa, look at the incredible asset. It's down 40%. Meanwhile, this is probably the most interesting asset or one of the most interesting assets in the entire crypto space. Being down 40% doesn't mean shit. It broke out of historic resistance. This is post-Golden Cross on the daily. Look at that Golden Cross down there. Do we even have a Golden Cross on the weekly? No, because we don't have a fifth. We don't have a, a 200 SMA. But you got a 200 SMA that prints on the daily back here. October 1st, and we're in November 17th. Beautiful Golden Cross. And what happened the last time we had a Golden Cross? It's probably right about there. I think uh, nothing has changed with regard to my opinion about Curve. This is one of the most interesting assets in the crypto space. The 40% dip, down to 40% dip. <laughs> um, let me ask a answer a couple more questions. Uh, best thing about incoming is precisely that you are more comfortable holding through ups and downs and you end up letting time do its magic. That's right. APY is this is magic. Einstein said it, baby. Eighth wonder of the world. Health. You mentioned you don't like auto compounders. Is that due to risk on fees they take? No. Uh, maybe my opinion about auto compounders is changing. Um, I, I I tend to. I'm never early, never late. And I, historically, I didn't like meme names, but Beefy has proven itself at this point proven itself very well across multiple chains as a legit auto compounder. Um, and Yak on Avalanche has done quite well. Um, so auto compounders are powerful tools. Question is, how much risk? Is it worth it? And, and most of the time, uh, you don't know. But they've proven themselves. It's a simple, relatively simple uh programmatic implementation to periodically liquidate so it's not like it's difficult from software perspective i myself uh, have seen their code pretty straightforward i don't know i don't know how to answer that question entirely um i, I think i've been shying away less from auto compounders lately albeit i'm not using any of them so i don't know what that means anyway fala uh volatility on stock market fine too yeah but it's kind of they're useless assets they're non-productive assets to do jack shit they're literally uh, negative real rates of returns if you get two percent nominal you get like minus fifty thousand percent real considering inflation so it's just useless assets i have mixed feelings because um i got stocks that are just sitting there doing jack shit that but then again, they have a 2030 time horizon, so that's another story. Um, 
Ahmed, good morning, Cap. Hope you are doing good. Thoughts on having an Expo, XJO, D quick position. Each one is accumulating FTM, AVEX. Well, you got incoming down. I don't I can't say much else about what you just said. You you are an incoomer. And you'll tell us in the following weeks and months how well you did. We only know in hindsight how well we did. Or is it better to be focused on multi-chain assets such as curb spell ice? Better is subjective, only you'll be able to answer that question. Um, hey Noah, Avax is on a roll. What are your thoughts? I feel DeFi and Ohm forks are making the money ball bounce that way. Um, well, look, you're chasing. You're chasing the yield. You're chasing the rabbit. Chasing the dragon. Stop chasing. Sit back and relax. Find a couple hundred dollars a day. Find five hundred dollars a week and change your life. Focus on your life. Stop trying to chase income. Um, that's my opinion. I, I don't. I don't mean to say that and make anyone feel bad, but uh, I, I find. I find most people's behavior in the crypto space a bit distasteful. Everyone's a little bit greedy, trying to find, oh, what's the next hot thing? Oh, Shiba, Shiba Kwaku. It's up 20 bajillion percent. Are you sitting in front of your computer all day? When's the last time you got out of the house? So that's, that's the whole point. Incoming lets you get out of the house, focus on your life and the purpose of these assets. The purpose of these assets are to be businesses on a balance sheet, a subsidiary that generates cash flow and is collateralizable. Operate individually as a business. Anyway, I don't mean to say anything bad about anyone's behavior. I just would like to see people do better, not just with their portfolios, but for themselves. And to do better for yourself, what is the purpose of the crypto space? The purpose of the crypto space is to not be sitting there focusing on the crypto space. Is to use the crypto space for what it could optimally do, which is give you freedom. Freedom where you're out at a park making money. Or you went out to dinner and you literally made the money for dinner while you were at dinner. Or, all right, you went to the shopping mall to get a pair of jeans. By the time you got back from the shopping mall, you made the money to pay the bill that you got going to the shopping mall. You went out rollerblading. You made 200 bucks while you went out rollerblading. That's the biggest shit about the crypto space. That is crazy. You can't do that in legacy finance. You can't do that with dividends. And REITs, I don't care what stock, what what uh, what interest-bearing asset you use. You can't do that in legacy finance anymore. And that is some cool shit in crypto. I'm going to wrap this up in a couple minutes. Guys, got so many questions. Oh, my God. I can't, I'm never going to be able to answer all these questions, guys. I'm really sorry. I'm going to wrap this up. And let me take a look at the last couple. I'm skipping to the bottom. Skipping to the bottom. Steven wants a bajillion percent. Where can I get a bajillion percent? I Here's the kicker. I will choose 500% over a bajillion percent. Any second of any day. 500% is more reasonable. It's more rational. It's more logical. It makes sense to be likely more sustainable. It makes sense to likely have more less of a risk profile. Oh, I don't want a bajillion percent. I want 500%. And I want it to make sense. I want it to be like, oh, of course, that's why I'm getting 500% of my money. It makes sense. I'm going out. I'm going to rollerblade because I'm making 500% of my money and I'm not worried about it. You got to have peace of mind. If you're in the crypto space, like I'm making a bajillion percent, but oh, yeah, it's hyperinflationary shit. And tomorrow my asset is down 75%. What the hell was the point of making the bajillion percent? Alex uh, said, Shiba Kwaku. <laughs> uh, Fief, since uh, <laughs> uh, Gensler's groundbreaking video, you saved 60 bucks, $8 a week. Oh, he got it right. What insanity. What insanity that the, these institutions 
Um, don't they don't I don't they don't think they treat people with respect. Um, that's very. I found that video very insulting. Unfortunately, I mean that was an education. It's, that was an education. The five hundred percent tour. I am a five hundred percent tour ninja sauce. Um, all right, let's wrap this up. It's a pleasure, everybody. Wednesday, November 17th at 12.37 p.m. Thank you, everyone, for joining, as always. After party on Discord. That's where I hang out all day long. And I'm going to hit up my ask vids. I'll get everyone's questions answered. If anyone doesn't know my ask vids, it's right here. I'll pop it in the stream for you guys. I wish you all a wonderful day. Um, let me see if I'll get it a Thursday stream, but I'll see you again on Friday at least. Y'all have a good one now. See you then. Peace.